Hello, welcome back for some more uh, lectures on business ethics. Um, tonight we're going to be starting a new topic, the topic of affirmative action, and we're going to be looking at Hedinger, and then uh, for next Tuesday we're going to look at Pojman. So we're going to get kind of two sides of the story here. But both of these authors are really engaged with each other. And um, if you remember some of the things I was talking about um, as like uh, things to aim for with um, your own paper project, uh, things things that would be ideal about a good a good paper. I think Hedinger and Pojman too are um, not bad role models here uh, for in a couple respects. One, the amount of engaging with their opponent that they do is just top notch. That's that's definitely something to emulate. To be trying to think about the strongest possible arguments that your opponents have, and to deal with those. Um, and then also. Um, I think I even alluded to Hedinger in my lecture on Tuesday about uh, how organized he is. And that is, this is like one of the best things to try to mimic for your own work. Like the way that he's got it all broken down by headings, how he's trying to keep all these different argumentative concerns separate. Uh, and there are a lot. And if you're dealing with a pretty messy um, moral dispute, some rational controversy that's got a lot of facets to it, Making sure that those different argumentative appeals don't get mixed up with each other is actually going to be really important to do. And having some clear organizational structure to the paper, and even when you're putting the paper together initially with your brainstorming, like putting together an outline, already trying to track those kinds of um, organizational choices, I think will help your brainstorming a lot too. So these are these are good papers for us to be looking at right now, right when you're kind of getting started with envisioning the paper, which, by the way, still a lot of people haven't talked to me yet about paper topic ideas, and I strongly encourage you to do that sooner rather than later. Um, definitely by the end of this week, is, that's what I was saying would be the most ideal thing, um, but definitely don't skip the step of, of talking to me about it and clearing a topic. Um, that'll, that'll help you a lot, I think. Um, and make sure that the work that you're putting in is uh, productive work for for uh, the thing that we're aiming at doing. Um, in terms of getting started with the affirmative action topic, though, there's a few little introductory things that I want to talk about. The first one is something that actually Pojman starts his paper with, um, and that's with how controversial this discussion can be, how like loaded it is. People have really strong opinions, and there is a tendency to kind of um, demonize opponents. So if you're for affirmative action, saying that people who oppose affirmative action are really just trying to rationalize uh, things like racism and sexism and stuff like that, prejudice, like that's, maybe some people do that, but that's not something that is essential to the opposition of affirmative action. And if you oppose affirmative action, to treat the people who are uh, promoting it as if they are just as bad as um, people who uh, are involved in traditional discrimination, that also would be a major mistake too. So, But there, there's some pretty big values that are coming to a head here in the debate about affirmative action. Um, Uh-oh. Hey, everyone in chat, is the video and audio coming through? I just got a weird pop-up from my computer. Are you looking good? I just want to double check really quickly here. You can hear me? Uh oh. Okay, sorry about that little break. Um, so, yeah, there's this real big tendency for demonizing the opponent and all this kind of stuff. And uh, Pojman talks about this a little bit more eloquently, but the bottom line here, which I, I think is a good attitude to go into this debate with, is recognizing, and this is great for your paper topics too, recognizing that people who are informed, thoughtful, sincere, morally invested, truth seekers can disagree about matters of great importance. Um, that can happen, and that definitely happens in the affirmative action debate. Um, so. Whatever side of this you're on, I really encourage you to try to use some charity here. Uh, don't be really be on guard against straw manning people on the other side um, as if they're guilty of all sorts of 
unvirtuous things either intellectually or morally and that's why you might think that they disagree with whatever side you think is right um, I'm very familiar with this topic being the one that elicits the most um, like heated in-class conversation that uh, that happened a little bit in my other section this afternoon um, there definitely was a very lively discussion that was happening. People were jumping in, asking questions all the time. Uh, I wasn't able to really just go through my lecture <laughs> and the plan that I originally had because people were like, what about this? What about that? that, that? So we kind of jumped around a little bit. Um, if you in the chat tonight have some big questions or reactions to what's what are the arguments I'm explaining from Hedinger, please, please jump in. Um, I think it's really valuable. I think it enriches the conversation. Um, and I say that all the time anyway, but especially for this topic too. Um, so I wanted to, re to re just kind of offer that kind of reminder that um, this isn't good guys versus bad guys kind of thing. It's uh, people on different positions on this issue. Um, there are sincere people who occupy both sides and it is pretty indeterminate. And it's still a very live conversation. I mean, there's every year there's some kind of news in the affirmative action debate whether it's some kind of court ruling or someone's trying to challenge it or some some like incident occurs um, a lot of affirmative action issues also happen in the world of college applications for admissions for for colleges and universities um, and a lot of the same debates that are going to happen here with the hiring process happen there too um, but this is this is a really messy debate and one of the reasons why it's also messy this is another um, thing I wanted to kind of throw in as a framing device for this. I mentioned on Tuesday that affirmative action is like this really weird intersection between ethical issues that are really uh, particular and specific in terms of their application. Like um, think about when we were talking about fiduciary duty and whistleblowing. It's about like what are the actions of particular employees? Um, how should they decide what to do with the power that they're given or the information that they're given in the case of whistleblowers um, so it's about really particular things and that applies in the context of affirmative action for managers who are engaged in hiring so like how should they make their hiring decisions that's that's this kind of end of it or one half of the mesh point but it also gets into really big picture issues about social justice um, and I mentioned we're going to have this topic on social and economic justice later on in the quarter, right at the end of the quarter. Um, but this issue is kind of a little sneak preview of some of that um, because the thing that affirmative action is trying to be sensitive to is bigger issues of social justice and a business's role in participating in that or not participating in that. So you get the, the scope on the biggest level and on the smallest scale kind of combining here in this topic. So there's going to be a lot of messy things going on there <laughs> with all that happening. Um, this kind of like nexus point at which basically all the shit hits the fan. Um, so I wanted to mention that. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was language. So you'll notice that um, Hedinger uses the language of reverse discrimination. And reverse discrimination really is referring, as a label, it's referring to the exact same thing as affirmative action. There's no real difference between them at all. Um, it's not like they're supposed to represent different proposals. Um, it's really just a rhetorical choice. And another callback from our lecture on Tuesday was that, um, you remember me mentioning how philosophers um, who are trying to do things sincerely, I think, as truth seekers, are careful about rhetorical choices because we don't want um, if someone agrees with our arguments we don't want it to be because of our rhetorical skill like how clever or eloquent we are um, we want it to be because of the substance of the arguments and claims that were thrown down on the table in the debate so Hedinger makes a very interesting choice here um, well actually first let's go to the labels themselves affirmative action reverse discrimination you can kind of feel that they've got this connotation there's this extra rhetorical stank that's put on them right like affirmative action sounds good like it's affirming something like being proactive in addressing an issue of social injustice that that makes it sound like something good right but reverse discrimination's got you know the connotations around discrimination which we think is bad you know discrimination's not good and reverse discrimination makes it sound like it might be just a step away or maybe actually in fact 
uh, reverse racism or reverse sexism or something like that. It's kind of got the connotation of um, a two wrongs situation, right? Like if this thing is bad, then to use more bad things to deal with the bad things doesn't seem to be a good thing to do, right? So those little connotations definitely flavor or color um, the proposal itself even before we get to any of the arguments about it or the moral values that can be appealed to in favor of it or in, uh, against it. Um, so it's interesting that to me, I, I think it's a good point of emphasis, that Hedinger makes this move to basically play with a handicap. He decides to, instead of using affirmative action, which is the label that would have the connotations that are more in line with what his position really is, because he's defending affirmative action, instead he um, chooses to use the word that has the connotations that cut against what he's really trying to prove. So I, I like describing this as playing with a handicap. It's like, if he's going to be effective, uh, if his arguments are going to be effective, then that's going to be despite the rhetorical influence that this choice of words has. So I think that's a very sincere choice on his part. Pojman does the same thing by using affirmative action, even though he's against it, he uses that label for it. Um, and so I, I think that's that's a really awesome choice to make. That's definitely a, a sign of good faith arguing on both of their parts. Um, I will probably stay strictly to the language of affirmative action, just so that there's some consistency and less confusion about what's going on here. Um, but uh, I think it's worth noting that stuff. Um, okay. The other final thing I've got to get started with this is that there's a big assumption that's sort of we have to grant for the sake of argument to follow Hedinger's arguments. And, and I, I'll be doing this too in my presentation of this debate. Um, and that assumption is this that uh, racism, sexism, and all these other kinds of uh, traditional, um, uh, this kind of a traditional oppression that then has carried for it, forward into our present day world in our society is still present. Um, that we're not out of the woods on this stuff yet. And when I taught this, when I started teaching this class like five, six years ago, I didn't even really make a big deal out of this because um, it just wasn't as much of a deal. I didn't have anyone coming along being like, uh, I don't see the need for this. Like, there, this, we don't have this problem anymore. But I hear that more and more today, <laughs> that people are seriously um, advancing the claim that we don't have these problems anymore, that we actually do have an equal society, that there is equal opportunity, that there isn't such a thing as privilege anymore. Um, and that, to me, just seems blatantly false, that we are not out of the woods on this. Um, and <clears throat> there's still more work to be done before we have a truly egalitarian, equal society. That, that That's not happening here uh, currently. We're, we, we have made uh, some progress on that, for sure, <laughs> definitely depending on how far back in history you're using as a benchmark uh, for comparison. Um, but it's not as though we have solved these problems and they don't really exist anymore and that the only reason people talk about them is for political purposes or identity politics or some stuff like that. Um, I'm going to, if you, if you disagree with me about this, if you think these problems really have been solved and that they're not things that we're facing in our society today, I'll ask you to go into this debate just granting that for the sake of argument because we won't have the time and space to go through proving that that's the case. If I was going to start doing that, I'd have to start presenting a mountain of empirical evidence to show the the uh, traces of this inequality that are still present in our society today. Um, I can give you one, one, just one example of, and I think there's, a, well, I know that there's a lot of other evidence here to look at. And if I really, if you don't believe that this is true, I would encourage you to go out and do your own research about this. Be very careful about what sources you're looking at, of course, because people skew statistics here to tell what narrative they want all the time. Um, but here's here's just one recent study that was done that shows that we, we definitely are not out of the woods. Um, this is in the last three years, I think. I think it was three years ago that the study happened. Um, but it was, they, they basically took uh, a bunch of people who agreed to kind of participate in this research as like actors that would go to banks um, basically looking to take out a home loan. That they, they were interested in buying a home and they wanted to see what kind of loans they could get from the bank. 
and they had exactly the same information to bring in. They're like their financial position, their salary, their assets, all that kind of stuff, their credit history, every everything was exactly the same except their race. And they did this at, a, at dozens and dozens of different banks and the consistent result was that um, people who were white got more of an offer of a loan than people that were not. <laughs> So um, as like one small little piece of evidence that there is still um, this kind of uh, unequal opportunity in our society for people in different demographics, um, that's one little small indicator of it, but there's just piles and piles and piles of other indicators that this is still happening. That's all I'm probably going to say about this here. If you want to talk with me outside of class about it, I would be very, very happy to, but um, we're, we're going to be focusing here on the moral stuff, but it's worth just pointing out that, because um, this is a part of the whole affirmative action proposal, that affirmative action is not meant to be a permanent solution. It's always meant to be a temporary measure, something that's going to get us quicker, um, and maybe even, as Hedinger says at the end of the paper, it's a necessary thing for us to make progress in moving toward a more equal, um, egalitarian society where there is equal opportunity. That's the goal here. And when that's achieved, then there's no need for affirmative action anymore. So it's not like this is a, a permanent, like, universal type of policy that it needs to happen in perpetuity. And as soon as we're in a state in which that equality has actually been achieved, then there is no cause for affirmative action. And having a debate about the ethics of it would really be more of an intellectual exercise, like a way of just exploring some of the logical space of theoretical ethics. Um, but I don't think, like I said, I don't think that's the case. I think this is a very real practical concern for us um, in what we're facing with our society today. Oh, and I forgot, one more early caveat here. Sorry for all the early introductory stuff, but there's a lot to set the stage here. If you remember back from my outline, like setting the stage in order to, follow the, uh, to be able to understand the arguments to follow later. One other big um, stage setting thing. Hedinger's paper really focuses on race and sex, but I don't think he intends for it to be limited to just those kinds of factors. Um, it's not just about uh, historical racism and historical oppression of women, but for any demographic that has been historically disenfranchised. And that, that's the kind of phrase I'm going to use a lot in the lecture today and um, with Pojman on Tuesday. I'll talk about disenfranchised demographics as just a catch-all for any of these things. So it's not just race and sex, but it could also be gender, it could be sexual orientation, it could be religious affiliation, it, uh, just class, um, economic class, all sorts of factors here um, are going to be relevant to this debate around affirmative action. So don't don't take uh, Hedinger's discussion of just race and sex as exhaustive, but more of just illustrative. Like it'll work in these sorts of ways, and you can pretty much take all the arguments that Hedinger is talking about with race and sex and apply them over to these other disenfranchised demographics. Mutatis mutandis which is a Latin phrase that means basically in the same way. So, so much for this, so also for this. Like, to be, you can just like plug and play, copy and paste the arguments right over into a different context. Okay, so that's all the real preliminaries we need here. Um, anyone in the chat, any questions about what I've thrown down in the last 20 minutes to set all this up? How are we doing? How's it going? Good? Okay, I'm making sense. Any Anything you want clarified? Mm, not hearing from anybody? Um, oh, Theo, you got something? Okay, so you agree with most of this and what Edinger says. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'll put my cards on the table. Um, 
I'm going to give you a presentation of both both sort of sides of this debate. But in, in case you're wondering, my, my afternoon students were wondering too. Um, personally, I'm a little bit more on the side here of Hedinger. I think affirmative action is not doing something unjust, and I think it's a pretty good tool in our toolkit. Um, it might also be worth um, clarifying that on Hedinger's part here, um, he uh, he's not thinking affirmative action is the sort of well, oh, some crazy goose. Um, he's not thinking of affirmative action as a, somehow a silver bullet here that this is all we have to do to get rid of racism, sexism, and all sorts of other prejudice and inequality in our society. Um, and he, he does say toward the end of the paper he thinks it's going to be a necessary step for progress. Um, that's a much stronger sort of claim, but I think at the very least this is an effective tool and I, for my part I don't think that there's any moral reason or grounds for saying we shouldn't be doing it. But there are definitely arguments to that effect, and Hedinger is going to try to address those. Um, I would want to address those too if I was defending this. Um, but it is, it, I mean, from my conversations with students and just people in society, like affirmative action just like smells really bad to people. They're us usually their initial reaction to it is like, this is terrible. And part of what Hedinger wants to do in this paper is to kind of debunk some of, a lot of the classic arguments that are used against it, especially the ones that are sort of initially offered. That um, you, you might say these are like misconceptions about it and about the basis of justification for it. Um, but we'll get to that as we get to that here. Um, there, Hedinger definitely is, the whole paper is set up of like, here are these arguments against affirmative action, and here are my replies to them. But he groups them up into what he calls spurious objections and then what he thinks are legitimate objections. And maybe I can say a couple words about this. The spurious objections are basically those arguments which might look good initially, but under investigation, Hedinger believes they basically evaporate into nothing, that they basically don't hold any water, that they're based on mistaken moral reasoning, suspect bases, things like that. Um, whereas the legitimate objections are those arguments that Hedinger is like, that's a good point. Like, that's getting at something that actually is morally relevant to affirmative action and kind of speaks against affirmative action. There's something morally problematic about affirmative action. But his response to those objections is going to say that they are not um, sufficient to undermine the reasons for doing affirmative action. So kind of think about... Um, I was talking about this a little bit in the talk on Tuesday where you're like trying to defend, like we, we were talking about prima facie considerations in the whistleblowing stuff too. That like you might have certain moral considerations that have some weight to it, but they could be overridden by other arguments in trying to figure out what's the most rationally defensible position on this. So with the legitimate objections, Hedinger's basically taking his lumps. He's like, yep, that's a problem. I acknowledge it. I think it's got a... a it has a leg to stand on here. The, the moral appeals that are being made are legitimate, but on balance, they're not enough to defeat um, uh, having a good moral justification for engaging in affirmative action. Um, oh, that was a, a little thread that I had in my head and then I, I never got out. Um, when I was talking before about Hedinger's claim toward the end of the paper that um, affirmative action is going to be a necessary step for us creating... Uh, an egalitarian society, to have a, a society in which it, there truly is equality of opportunity. Um, why would he say that? I mean, he doesn't get into it a whole lot. But I, I might be able to help him out here a little bit by saying, well, the way that, the, imagine like in the past, it's kind of indisputable that um, there was this kind of uh, historical oppression of these disenfranchised demographics. Like that happened. And it gave other people advantages. And uh, even after the direct harm has stopped, the direct injustice has been eliminated, like say slavery is illegal now, that kind of thing, like slavery has ended, there still is going to be aftershocks. Like people got power and wealth and social position um, as a result of those injustices, and it's not like those evaporate right away. They, they sort of have a ripple effect going forward. And the way that power works is... It takes stupidity or luck for that power to get redistributed. Once people have power, they like to hang on to it. They protect it. Um, they try to leverage it to get more power. So it's very hard for, their, for you to kind of 
upset that system and just let it turn into equality like like the ripple effects might not just you know if we let them go just dissipate on their own accord and then those inequalities aren't there anymore um, although I think time does help with this but there's also a way in which we might be concerned about how that ripple kind of perpetuates itself and continues to protect itself going forward through time and something like affirmative action can interrupt that process um, and uh, change change the state of the game kind of like um, rearrange people's positions so that that sets up a future in which people are running uh, and interacting with each other on more equal terms in the future that there is more of that genuine equality of opportunity um, we'll talk about this a lot more with Pojman but the goal here is not um, equality of outcome it's not saying everyone needs to make the same money or something like that it's not opposed to it's not like affirmative action is opposed to income inequality or that it's about a kind of communist project of redistribution of wealth or something like that this is this is really a matter of how once you're down it is really hard to have social mobility and another reason why I think affirmative action has, has a negative a lot of people have an initial negative reaction to it is that the way that you let me put it this way the perspective on what's going on in our society that would make it justifiable to do something like affirmative action cuts against a lot of our cultural myths as Americans especially meritocracy pulling people uh, the kind of individualism that has this narrative of how people pull themselves up from their bootstraps and this kind of American dream that if you just work really hard you can be as successful as anybody but that's what's going on and to say our society is not equal that it doesn't have equality of opportunity flies in the face of that kind of mythological myth or story uh, mythological myth redundant uh, mythological story or narrative um, so you kind of it, it challenges some of the basic paradigms from which we operate as Americans and think that what's going on here is justified can be rationally justified um, it might be that the basis of that is not true okay but that's enough preliminaries um, let's get into the arguments themselves so um, again if you're in the chat I recommend uh, following along with my lecture notes and you can find them in the file section of canvas um, when it comes to the proposal of affirmative action itself um, Hedinger distinguishes between a weak version and a strong version so again let's get into the the setting or the context here of a manager who's having to make a hiring decision and what should they do to um, make that decision and most of the time you know we're kind of thinking all our things being equal we're thinking that the manager is going to look at applications conduct interviews and then try to pick the applicant that is the most qualified for the job um, weak affirmative action is when let's say you've got a number of applicants who are more or less equally qualified maybe there's some differences but they're very negligible ones um, or really indeterminate ones like how do you measure this extra certification against these extra years of experience you know about that or like people have different styles but they all they both might be effective leaders it's pretty hard to um, maybe compare those things but if you got people you're like you know what I'd be really happy with this person in the job and this person and this person you know there's there's not a clear winner here in terms of who's the most qualified then weak affirmative action is saying tip the balance tip the scales in favor of hiring the applicant who is coming from one of these disenfranchised demographics that's how weak affirmative action goes and that's a lot easier to justify um, <clears throat> it's not open to the same kinds of concerns that strong affirmative action is open to as objections but Hedinger's not going for the low-hanging fruit he's going for the strong claim he wants to defend the controversial claim uh, strong affirmative action is when you prefer the applicant who comes from the disenfranchised demographic even when they are less qualified than another applicant so it's not when they're equal here it's actually you hiring the less qualified applicant um, <clears throat> now the next question I'm very used to hearing from students is you know how big of a difference are we talking about here um, one thing I can definitely say on behalf of Hedinger here is that he is not proposing to hire people who do not meet minimal minimal qualifications for the job that like can't do it competently at all that is not the proposal here 
Um, but it's when there's a di there still is a significant difference in qualifications. The not all of the objections that Hedinger is going to be entertaining from the opponents of affirmative action uh, work the same way. In other words, some of them are going to be sensitive to any kind of relative distance of the lack of qualification here. Other arguments wouldn't the degree wouldn't be important or significant in evaluating them. But there are going to be some objections that are sensitive to how much of a disparity is there in those qualifications. Um, and in that case, the force of the objection is proportionate to how much of a gap we're talking about. So we'll, we'll get to that when we get to that, but um, I wanted to alert you to that right off the bat. bat. Okay. Um, anything else from chat before I get started with the first argument? Okay, so the first of these spurious objections, again, spurious objections are the ones that Hedinger thinks don't actually ultimately hold weight. They might look like they got a point to make, but under investigation, they really don't. Um, so this first one, I think it's, I, I actually think it's a, a intentional choice that Hedinger wants to deal with this one first. And this is connected to what I was talking about, about how the phrase reverse discrimination already kind of sounds bad to a lot of people. And that's this argument that says reverse discrimination is equivalent, morally equivalent, to racism, sexism, prejudice, oppression, inequality, more generally. Um, that basically discrimination is discrimination. And reverse discrimination is just doing the same bad thing as the thing that it's criticizing and trying to solve. Um, they are unjust on exactly the same grounds. Um, Pojman's going to talk about this argument too. Uh, in, incidentally, they both Hedinger and Pojman agree that di discrimination is not inherently wrong. So to, to actually uh, make decisions about treating people differently, including hiring decisions based on these kinds of characteristics, of these demographic characteristics, is not automatically, universally, categorically wrong. Um, I, just to skip ahead a little bit here, Hedinger brings up um, all of these sort of case examples of places where we have really straightforward intuitions that say, yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah, pay attention to race there. Pay attention to sex there. That would be appropriate. What else are you going to do? He's not bringing up, this is a thing we had to clarify in my last class. Um, Hedinger's not using these as examples of affirmative action, but just as counterexamples to the claim that discrimination is inherently, categorically, unconditionally wrong. What we might think of as being absolutely wrong, no exceptions, is what we're going to call traditional discrimination. Um, and Hedinger's response to this objection um, in total here is to say, look, these are not morally the same. Um, because the kinds of things that affect the way that we immorally evaluate actions uh, or phenomenon has to do with motives, intentions, and consequences. And on those fronts, they're not, they're not the same. Um, as I say here in the lecture notes, traditional discrimination involved contempt, loathing, judgments of inferiority, and thoughts of impropriety if there was an elevated status for these other demographics. Like, people didn't want to have them as their managers. They thought that would be wrong. That's like disturbing the proper social order because these people don't deserve to have the same status as, say, white males, right? But none of those things happen in reverse discrimination. It's not like the proposal of reverse discrimination is to hate white males or to think of them as inherently evil or something like that. That's, that's, that's wacky. That is, uh, if there are people out there that take those attitudes, those are straw men. <laughs> those are not the strongest possible defenders of this policy of, of strong affirmative action. Um, it, you don't, it's not like if you approve of affirmative action, you are saying white males are not worth as much as human beings as opposed to these people that come from demographics that were historically oppressed, right? And that's why this isn't an identity politics sort of thing. It's also not um, a battle of um, who's been oppressed more or something as if oppression gives you legitimacy as a human. Like, that's not what's going on. There's an independent basis for why we are concerned about what happens to people and whether they have equal, equality of opportunity. It's on the basis of universal human rights, that everyone has that kind of dignity. That's why we'd be concerned if there's some inequality happening. 
Just similarly about these motives and intentions, the consequences are not the same between traditional discrimination and affirmative action slash reverse discrimination. Um, traditional discrimination promotes stigmatization, stereotypes, and greater inequalities of social and economic benefits. People are given less opportunities. Um, and these are not consequences of reverse discrimination. Um, might they be? Some people could take them that way, but that's not a necessary requirement of this. And if we're keeping in mind like why we're doing what we're doing, we'll do it in a way that doesn't have those kinds of effects. Um, yeah, there's a... Oh, are people able to hear me? Hello? Uh, I just got a message, the server is down. Now we can. Okay, where did you leave? Where'd you lose me? Here, I'll pause the video. All right, sorry for that hiccup in the server. So um, we can get a little bit more technical with this argument. Um, I, I mentioned uh, Kursgaard and Nussbaum, uh, Martha Nussbaum and Christine Kursgaard, these kind of contemporary neo-Kantians. Uh, <clears throat> if you remember, Kant really thought that actions get their moral worth based on the reason why they are performed. Um, so that's a matter of evaluating actions, but Kursgaard and Nussbaum in, sort of independently both argue that we should think about actions themselves as involving things like intentions. That, that's a part of understanding what it means to do that action. So to even use the same word to talk about um, traditional discrimination and reverse discrimination just not be appropriate. It'd be like that example we talked about um, about the rescue right like if someone thinks that someone is rescuing a child that's drowning but what they really think they're doing is just salvaging clothes it'd be like well if that's their intention of going out in the water what they're doing is not performing a rescue right they are attempting to salvage clothing it just so happens there's a child in there who's drowning right um, so if we're thinking about evaluating what action it is in a way that already includes things like intentions then these these two types of policies cannot be equated with each other. They're just apples and oranges. Um, the, the thing that they are, uh, the reason why they can be grouped into a category, a conceptual category of discrimination, is just the sense that people are being tr treated differently. Like when you, um, like discrimination is happening in a meritocratic hiring process. If you're going to hire the most qualified person for the job, you're discriminating between people. And you're discriminating in favor of the people that are more qualified. So the question is, is there any reason to discriminate, to treat people differently based on things like race, sex, gender, sexual orientation, blah, blah, blah? Um, in a vacuum, no. But if there's inequality and we're trying to fix it, yes. <laughs> That's basically Hedinger's argument. Um, okay. Um, that theme will get picked up again more soon. Any questions about that argument from chat? There's a lot of different arguments to get through, and they're all really different from each other, so I kind of want to check in after each one to see where your thoughts are with it. Um, anything you want to ask about? I'm, uh, I'm not hearing anything, but I, I'm particularly interested in asking about this argument because uh, something I'm used to happening in this class happened again this afternoon with my other section where um, we got through the whole lecture and we were, student did their presentation and we were having some discussion and someone brought up again like, but it's the same wrong, right? Like you, you can't, this is like reverse racism. Like just because racism happened in the past doesn't mean that justifies us being racist in the opposite direction now. And it was like, yeah, Hedinger talked about that, right? He addressed that. And if you think that they are equivalent in some way, then you're going to have to deal with Hedinger's uh, attempt to say, look, there's a morally relevant difference between these two cases. And motives, intentions, and consequences, those are the main things that we're worried about when we're thinking about morally evaluating an action or a policy or something like that. So the grounds on which traditional discrimination is morally objectionable just doesn't fit or square with what... Tr uh, um, reverse discrimination is up to. Um, so I'm used to this being like a little tricky to like, it doesn't always land or sink in right away. So if there's anything that's like uh, resistant um, or that you're like, no, I think they're still the same thing and still morally problematic for in the same sort of way, I'd like to discuss that. Um, mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I personally, I'm like Hedinger makes a really strong case here uh, on this. I'm I'm really not sure how how uh, he could be argued against in this in this fashion, <clears throat> or, or again how his his uh, rationale that he's offering here could be resisted. The student that brought that up in class, we actually uh, have a plan to have a conversa follow-up conversation later, which I'm very excited about. I'm very interested to hear what he's thinking and where he's coming from with the with that idea. What is it about Hedinger's argument that still is like not kind of quite doing it for him in addressing that concern? And I don't know if any of you feel that way. Uh, chats who's here I can talk about, but if any of you watching this on YouTube later, if you are kind of finding yourself in the same boat that you're like, man, still something smells... E, I don't, I don't, I feels like, I, yeah, I get maybe what Hedinger is saying here. Those are maybe morally relevant differences, but there's still some kind of common denominator here. Um, that's when Hedinger just brings up the counterexamples. He says, if we think there's something inherently wrong with discrimination, that if you're thinking about that in the context of affirmative action, that's not how we're thinking about it in all these other contexts, um, like different jobs, research studies, stuff like that. It's, it makes sense in those cases. Uh, to discriminate based on these kinds of characteristics when it's linked with something like efficiency or just getting the job done, like that's the purpose of the company or something like that. Um, one of my students brought up a tanning salon. Like you want to hire white people for a, if you're running a tanning salon because they're the kind of people that would actually use a tanning salon. <laughs> that, was, that was her argument. Um, so, uh, you know, when it comes to efficiency and the purposes of the business or the service or good that's being offered, then we, are, we do think that this kind of stuff is relevant. Um, so why would we not think it's relevant when we're thinking about working toward the purpose of social justice, of equality? Uh, that kind of logic is something Hedinger is going to come back to. I'm bringing it up in this section on his behalf just because he emphasizes it so much with these other argumentative replies, and I think it fits here too. Um, Walter's got something here. Very sticky. Yeah. Is there something that you're... Sensitive to here, Walter? And things are going to get messy here. we got a lot more arguments to get through, too. While you're typing, Walter, um, oh, here we go. Use more examples to see it all in action. Um, well, there, I mean, it's it's not very complicated, these scenarios. It's like you've got different qualified applicants for a job, and you're making a hiring decision, and you're thinking, okay, how am I going to decide about this? And you're definitely going to be looking at qualifications. It's not like affirmative action is saying ignore that stuff. That's why I was saying Hendra's not proposing hiring people who are unqualified for a job or meet, don't meet some kind of minimal set of, of requirements uh, for competency here. Um, there's a lot of jobs, too. That, th that This is something I forgot to bring up in my afternoon lecture. You know, for certain jobs, like when we're talking about doctors or lawyers or things like that, these highly specialized jobs, higher qualifications can matter a lot, but there's a lot of jobs where it really doesn't. Like someone who's got way more training and experience can do the job, um, not really any better than someone who lacks those qualifications. Um, and especially in those cases, um, strong affirmative action seems to be on much stronger footing. Those are That's some of the only contingencies I can imagine of like case to case or something like that. Um, I might have to go help with bedtime here soon, um, but uh, yeah, that that's um, okay. Walter, you say okay. Um, yeah, this isn't quite like uh, say the whistleblower where it's like, oh, okay, you got to weigh all these different variables from situation to situation. It's going to be really different. Really, all this argument is about is is it right in principle for a hiring manager to be thinking about this kind of a factor? of the fact that one of the applicants comes from these one of these disenfranchised demographics and giving them the job would help with promoting equal opportunity in society into the future of like getting to that goal that we're shooting for um, as a society that's like 
the principles on which our country is founded, especially in America, um, that that's, uh, that's the question. Is it okay for them to be thinking that way about making a hiring decision? We're especially going to see this um, shit hit the fan when we get to what I think is really the heart of Hedinger's paper, when he's addressing all the arguments about why a failure to hire the, the most qualified person is somehow unjust. Um, and he's going to look at all the different ways that someone might appeal to certain moral values to claim that it's unjust and that try to debunk all of those. So hang on to that. But yeah, uh, um, the only, yeah, the only other contingent variable would be the amount of difference in qualifications and maybe what other sorts of responsibilities the manager has that they're beholden to like competing duties for how they hire their employees. So we'll, and we'll talk about that too. That's on the that's coming down the pipe. Um, okay, <clears throat> the next argument that Hedinger addresses is is pretty similar to the first. His response is very similar to the first, um, and it's this idea that race and sex are morally arbitrary and irrelevant characteristics. And I think this argument um, that that you shouldn't be making decisions for arbitrary reasons, and this this is kind of like. Um, I, if I'm trying to get inside the head of the opponent here and like try to give them a charitable fair shake, I think what they're doing is thinking, hey, in this vacuum, if we're imagining our equal opportunity utopia society, we wouldn't, people wouldn't be thinking about race and sex and all these other characteristics as something important for whether or not someone should get the job. And because in a sort of all things being equal idealistic scenario, we wouldn't operate that way, I mean, the point, the reason why we think so is because they really don't matter. Like a person's moral worth or whether we're willing to take a look at them or treat them fairly shouldn't be dependent on any of these other factors. They, they aren't factors that are relevant to that. So we shouldn't be doing it now. We should be living the way we think we ought to live in that utopia. And Hedinger's reply, I think he, he doesn't go quite this way, but he could. Um, I think he's got all the pieces in place here. He just doesn't connect the dots. I'm going to try to help him make this point a little bit more explicit. But I think he can say, like, yeah, I agree with you. Under those idealistic scenarios, we might not. it wouldn't be maybe right for us to think that way. Like, we wouldn't think about any of these variables in a hiring decision, for example. But as long as we're not in an equal situation, then we need to be thinking about those differences um, if, in order to address the inequality that's present. In other words... There might be a difference in strategy here between Hedinger and his opponents, or people that are, 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 are proponents of affirmative action, that by just ignoring it, it's not going to go away. We, that's why it's called affirmative action. we got to take some positive action to deal with it. People that support this generally hold that view. Um, just pretending, well, it doesn't matter to me. Like, I'm not racist. I'm not sexist. I'm not bigoted. I'm not making decisions on that basis. So what is happening is fine that doesn't make it go away, <laughs> the, especially when the inequalities are built into things systemically and are not just a function of individual people's prejudice and their like hate or animosity toward people from other demographics. Um, it can be built into how the system works too and a lot of unconscious biases and cultural messaging that it, be, it takes an incredible amount of self-awareness and reflectiveness to expose, unearth, and correct in ourselves. Um, and taking these kinds of courses of action, like getting people from these demographics into positions of uh, responsibility um, and improving their uh, social status and um, income and things like that, about like what kind of money they can make, is setting up a future in which there is more equality of outcome or of um, opportunity, not outcome, opportunity. That's very important. Um, okay, so. The way Hedinger goes with this is just to go back to his argument like, yeah, uh, discrimination is not irrelevant. It is very relevant in many cases. And if it's relevant in these cases, it can also be relevant when the purpose is to end conditions of inequality. Okay. Now, that still has to be defended. That, like, we ought to be taking courses of action to try to deal with social inequality. But um, that's going to be the basis of it. Okay, this next argument is a really crucial one, too. Um, I need to check in really quickly with what's going on with the bedtime situation. People in the chat, if you have any questions, um, plop them down in the chat box. I'll be right back. Okay, getting back to the next argument. 
Reverse discrimination is unjustified stereotyping. Here's another objection against uh, affirmative action. And the basic concern here is, <clears throat> I can put it informally as like treating a person like a statistic or using someone's membership in a category um, as the basis on which we're going to decide how to treat them rather than treating them as an individual, like being sensitive to their individual circumstances. Um, just right at the outset here, before I go any further, this objection attaches to affirmative action really only under a certain way of trying to justify affirmative action morally. And that's something Hedinger's going to use uh, in his reply, basically. He's going to say, yeah, some other people might try to defend affirmative action in this way, but I'm not doing that. So this objection basically doesn't apply to me. Um, <clears throat> he basically just denies straight up, this isn't what he's doing. He's The, the way that he's talking about um, strong affirmative action as a hiring policy and the rationale behind it is treating people as individuals based on their individual characteristics, not treating them based on these category membership sorts of things, not on the basis of stereotypes. Um, but how would it maybe look like it could be doing that? Well, if we were trying to justify affirmative action on the grounds of what's called compensatory justice, like this idea of reparations, like the German government um, still pays checks yearly, uh, reparation checks to Israel and to Jewish communities because of the Holocaust. Right? They're like, yeah, we screwed up. Like that was a deep injustice that we perpetrate, perpetrated. And there's kind of no way to make up for that kind of harm and the ongoing harm, the ripple effects of that harm, but some kind of compensation acknowledging the harm that's been done is appropriate. Um, so that's how, that's sort of the logic of reparations as like a just response to unjust action. Um, to try to like make it right, even if you can't make it right, even the attempt is, is something meaningful in that it's acknowledging the injustice. And it, <clears throat> there is a, a, a way Pojman's actually going to argue against this argument. Um, and it's noteworthy that you don't have to endorse that kind of logic to support affirmative action. You don't have to think that this is somehow making up for past oppression, historical oppression. Um, now we're going to give you opportunities now because your ancestors didn't get those opportunities back then. If that was the case, you can see how there's stereotypes involved with this, right? The people who are getting the advantages now from affirmative action opportunities and the people who are passed over for employment who lose those opportunities, the more qualified applicants that are white males or you know members of the enfranchised or privileged demographics, they're taking a, a kind of burden, a hit here. Those people aren't the people that were historically harmed or the historical perpetrators of that harm. They're just the descendants, right? And so this can also be connected with arguments that say something like, you shouldn't be punishing these innocent people today for what their ancestors did. They're, they're not the same moral agents. Like this, this kind of connection of like sins being passed from generation is not morally appropriate, right? And Hedinger brings up another kind of way in which someone could have a concern about this, that if you, you're you just looking at people from different categories um, and you're trying to even things out, that it doesn't always work out that way. There are exceptions to the rule, even if um, women, blacks, other disenfranchised demographics are proportionately um, making less money, having less opportunities in society, you can always pick some outliers there, um, that there could be a poor white male that is doing way worse than a very privileged black female. Like, that can happen. Um, and to choose in favor of one versus the other seems to be inappropriate, um, it, given their individual circumstances. But again, Hedinger says, this isn't what I'm doing. I'm not talking about someone's class membership as being, or category membership as being the grounds on which they should get the job. Rather, think about it like this, and I wish Hedinger used this language for it because I think it gets the point across a little bit more clearly. Treat a person's characteristics of their race or their sex or their religious affiliation or their sexual orientation or whatever it is as a kind of qualification. Oh, sorry about that. I just had a sneeze. Um, so yeah, treat these uh, the individual having those characteristics as like a qualification just not a qualification for them to do the job efficiently or promote profits for the company or something like that, but as a kind of qualification that enables them to be able to have this effect 
on uh, for the purpose of these of social equality and what could that look like well there's a lot of different ways this could look like Pochman's going to get into this quite a bit in his paper um, and criticizing it but things like being able to be a role model that inspires other people from that demographic to have the hope and confidence that they can succeed in in having a job like this um, the way in which a lot of times the way the that people have unequal opportunities has to do with the status of their parents like who you, what kind of household you're born in um, if you give these more lucrative important jobs to people from these disenfranchised demographics then their children are going to benefit from this um, and then they're going to be able to have more opportunity going into the future right this kind of thing it also reduces the stigma that people have just generally about having someone be in that kind of position so uh, actually I've got some pers more personal examples, ones that are more relevant to my profession of being a philosopher um, philosophy's got some big problems with especially uh, representation of minorities and women the women thing is improving faster than the minorities but it's still it's pretty far off and there's 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 some reasons for this that may not have to do with things like historical oppression but there are still it's still problematic uh, especially because um, almost all the teachers I ever had in my philosophy training were white males almost all of them and when that when something like that happens then people in society more generally expect that people who look like that do those jobs and maybe do them well, right? It's not weird. Um, but when someone who doesn't look like what you expect is in that job, there can be some biasing effects here. And it may not be something that someone is intentionally thinking about, that they're like, oh, it's a woman, so she can't be a good philosopher. Like that doesn't, maybe that happens sometimes, but that's, that, that's not the main concern here. Um, in, in the philosophy department at BC, um, one of my colleagues is uh, Zoe Alshire, and she's a woman, and we talk a lot about our teaching, and when we share stories about what's going on in our classes, um, it's pretty clear that she deals with way more back talk and like students challenging her authority than I ever get. I almost never get this, honestly. It's very rare that a student goes after me or is like kind of trying to sabotage or undermine class discussion or something like that and I don't think it's a personality thing like I've, I've known Zoe for years now and like I said we talk a lot about our teaching I think she's just as good and competent a philosophy teacher as I am it's not like she's mean or something she's a very nice person <laughs> like she's very open and understanding wants to talk to students does it just as much as I do um, very accessible uh, very charitable um, even less demanding in some ways than I am on certain parameters for assignments and things like that I mean but she gets so much of those sorts of cases and I'm like I get almost none so like what's going on here right now that's just an anecdotal type of case but I think that those kinds of phenomenon happen and to have more people who come from these demographics in these jobs creates a, a kind of social awareness that there's not a big deal around this it's not something weird or different that needs to stand in extra uh, need of justification or something like that so those are the things that can be helpful that th those are the ways in which giving the job to someone who's in one of these disenfranchised demographics produces an effect which moves us closer for a truly egalitarian society where there is equality of opportunity it's the person having those characteristics that puts them in a unique position to be qualified in doing that work that's really Hedinger's logic um, so uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. so he's he is completely denying that he wants to justify affirmative action on the basis of looking at the past of making up for past injustices that's not the point for Hedinger for Hedinger it's always about looking forward and what we're trying to create and this is uh, the way to do it he thinks this is, a, this is another effective tool in the toolkit it's not the only one but he does think it is maybe a necessary one but definitely is a one <laughs> and the way that that tool is used doesn't have to involve this unjustified stereotyping or treating people as statistics or that kind of thing um, oh yeah 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 this was a uh, this was something that came up in the conversation um, uh, earlier today with my other section and I wanted to bring it up to you too someone was like um, if I was a person in one of these disenfranchised demographics I wouldn't want to get the job 
just because of an affirmative action policy. That would feel kind of cheap. I'm like, I want to deserve this job. And that's why it wouldn't be as much of an accomplishment. And I think this argument that Hedinger's making maybe helps to um, understand how um, how uh, that may not be the only way to approach or understand the attitude around uh, being given a job because of affirmative action. It could be more like, you know, after getting a job feels good, right? You're like, yeah, success, right? You know, you're like, I've been working for this, and then it happens. Um, but as soon as that is done, then it's like, okay, now i got to do all this work. Right now, you have to actually be competent in that job, and to be given a position like this, even if you weren't the most qual qualified, well, you're not. That means you're not going to be able to take this thing of like I'm superior than everyone else or something like that. But really, the way Hedinger's thinking about it is like we're giving you this job because we're expecting you to do something. Like you, it's kind of like getting a mandate to do your job well as being a representative. Uh, of people from these demographics, which is pretty tough. And honestly, if I've got any problem uh, here with this kind of argument, it's um, it comes back to this issue of how people from disenfranchised demographics generally carry an unequal share of the burden in correcting society and making it more equal. Um, and I, I don't think that that would be fair, <laughs> you know, all of things being equal. It's maybe something that I, I've thought maybe it's uneliminable. It's just one of the unfortunate realities and another sort of side effect of inequality. If there's anything we can do about it, I think we should, but it may be something that has to happen here. Um, but then it, would, it wouldn't be so much like a blow to the pride or something as more of like an aspirational call. That's like, there's something here to work for. Now that I got this job, I should do something with it. Another student brought up this afternoon of like, well, what if the employer is just sort of doing this for having the token whatever employee kind of thing? So they're not really thinking about social justice. They just want to make it look good to the public. And they, you know, the student was like, that seems immoral. Like that doesn't seem virtuous. That's not something that should happen. I'm like, completely agree with that. But you can also take it if you're a person getting the job for that reason, it can feel kind of icky. Right, like I don't want to take this job and be complicit in your bullshit of just trying to have a good PR campaign. But I want I when I was responding to this student, I brought up a little anecdote from my life in the last year that I, I want to share with you too. Uh, I think it's I think it's helpful. Um, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. Take it for whatever it's worth. But uh, at the church I go to, that I serve as kind of a community leadership function with. Um, we host a share shelter, a homeless shelter at the church. And because of that, my pastor got invited into this community committee uh, that the city of Seattle set up to address Nicholsville or to like kind of help with the management of Nicholsville. And the city set up this council really as a shield to deflect criticism and accountability. They wanted a buffer. So if like something goes wrong, they can blame the committee instead of taking the heat themselves. Not a very noble reason for doing this, right? For giving this council, giving the power and position to the people in the community to make up this council. First meeting, my pastor goes in there and he's like, so this is basically bullshit what the city is doing, but now that we've got this committee, let's do what we want with it. Just because they have different motives for giving us this position doesn't mean those have to be the motives we follow. Let's take this and do some good with it. Let's try to fight for some justice here. Let's try to improve conditions. Even if, if the city is not really invested in that and they're just looking to deflect criticism, now that they've given us the power, it's up to us to decide what we want to do with it. And I think that attitude would be available here too if, uh, if I'm imagining myself, like I'm a white male, right? So I have to imagine, I have to use my imagination here. But if I'm trying to imagine myself in a position of being in a disenfranchised demographic and receiving a position because of an affirmative action, a strong affirmative action hiring policy, I could be like, and I, and I think that my employer is not really interested in social justice. They're just looking to increase profits by having more people, you know, that make it look like they're progressive company or something when they don't really care about it. If I'm really confident about that, I'll be like, I'll take your job anyway. <laughs> and I'll take this opportunity to leverage this power of my position to be able to work toward that good. I can still do that. So in some ways, it doesn't matter the motives of the employer. If the hiring practice just happens that way, that can still do good in promoting social justice in the sense of creating this uh, working toward moving society in the direction of what would be a truly egalitarian equal opportunity society okay um, I think this is when I got to take my break here 
Uh, it's about time for a break anyway, but I'm going to go help my uh, son go to bed. Uh, and then I'll be back as soon as I possibly can. Hopefully this will only be like 10, 15 minutes. But um, as we're having the break, people in chat, think about if you've got any questions from what we've done for the first half of the lecture tonight. Drop them into the conversation bar, and I'll try to address some uh, when I get back. So I'll be back soon. Oh, here's some questions. Oh, boy. Right when I start recording. Perfect. Okay. Um, thought of something. Um, so Walter says here, I had a recent experience last quarter where students went to a sustainability conference hosted by a UW. I almost didn't make it, but I'm glad that I did as one of the workshops I attended where mostly instructors discussed how to incorporate sustainability into the lessons where appropriate and on social justice with talks about how to invite minorities to these conversations. I was very surprised to find myself in a room with more than 50 people where I was the only minority there, plus two ladies of Asian descent. Uh -huh. So the arguments we're covering are, are interesting to me, especially after this experience. Um, can you help me make uh, some of the connections here, Walter, with um, how this uh, story like illustrates something that we're talking about or that you uh, sort of connected with uh, an argument to justify a certain perspective? Also, if you want to talk, too, and use the microphone, Walter, you're very free to do that. Uh, I guess trying to figure out how to approach these arguments while having a very different experience. Um, hmm. Uh, so maybe you can help me understand um, what it is about a difference in experience that you think changes how the arguments get understood or evaluated. I guess some of the things I was talking about toward the end before the break were related to like what kind of attitude you might take about getting hired under an affirmative action policy. I mean, that, that is going to be definitely firmly into the sticky territory um, of like different people's experiences would inform what kind of attitudes they take, what values they have, stuff like that. Is that, is that you, Walter, on the, the audio here? Oh, it's someone else? Okay. Oh, yes, I definitely don't want to be a token. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that just feels disgusting. Um, it's, it is, that, that's like an experience of being reduced to a statistic, right? Um, instead of being acknowledged as a person. Um, this might also get connected with some of the stuff I was talking about at the beginning about how 
in in a, probably a lot of different ways the perspectives and arguments that are involved with defending affirmative action fly in the face of some of the cultural values that are very commonly present in America, especially around like our dignity being connected with our success. So um, how I can have self-respect as a person, uh, the basis on which I do this, and to do it in a kind of meritocratic type of system of like competition, of like I can feel good because of my ability to improve myself over other people or through competition or something like that. And it feels kind of like affirmative action is like spoiling the game, right? It's like um, if someone, like, uh, yeah, like, it, uh, yeah, there was an analogy I had earlier that I was thinking about between classes, and it feels really relevant to this. I don't, I'm kind of doing this on the fly, so it may not be as tight as I want to, but let's say like you're, um, you're running a race, and you uh, win the race, but then you find out that the person that you were racing against uh, basically threw the race. They intentionally didn't run as hard as they could so that you would win because someone is blackmailing them to lose, right? Like some bookie or something like that. That seems to like diminish or discredit the worth of you winning that race. Like it, it seems to undermine it entirely. Um, and this might be where someone like, uh, we could use some of the comments that Davis was making about like, yeah, there's some of these things that make sense as appropriate attitudes when we're thinking about sports, but when we're thinking about the business world with people's livelihood and like the structure of society, it's like we maybe shouldn't apply those attitudes directly over that like, yeah, it would be better to get this job as a result of just your own merits and qualifications and things like that. But in a likewise fashion, um, I was thinking about this analogy actually moving in a different direction. Imagine that you're in a privileged demographic and you get the job you wouldn't want to get the job either because of just some kind of bias or racism or sexism or something like that right that'd be kind of like it, it, to acknowledge that there are these inequalities in society seems to also cheapen the successes of people that are in the enfranchised demographics the people that have the privilege and I think that's often why they want to tell themselves a story like we're out of the woods, there isn't any social inequality, because they want to protect the legitimacy of their successes as a credit to them. Hang on to this idea, because we're going to talk about it again with uh, one of the arguments that's next on the chopping block here, um, about desert, of whether people deserve the job. I, I think regardless of the moral attitudes here, that is the context in which Hedinger is going to be treating it, it also applies for this kind of concern about whether um, getting a job because of affirmative action sort of cheapens it somehow. Um, so I, I don't know, is this kind of getting into the territory that you're uh, feeling, Walter? Or is there something else that you're wanting to call attention to um, that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of missing? Oh, it's getting left out. Okay, okay, cool. Let me know if you got some more things to add on this. I think I think this is a good thing to be exploring in context of all the rest of these arguments. But like I said, the next argument we're going to get into is going to get into this a little bit. So let's do it. Um, so this this is what I was saying earlier is like the heart of um, Hedinger's paper. I think I think this is getting at some of the most core intuitions of why people resist uh, affirmative action and think that there's something unethical going on with it. So the key claim here, and there's a lot of arguments that are, and they're all really different arguments in this section, but the common denominator is that all the different arguments that, and moral considerations that are brought up in this section are all attempts to justify this claim that a failure to hire the most qualified purpose person, the most qualified applicant, is doing something unjust. There's a lot of different ways in which someone could try to, try to defend a claim like that. Um, the first concern is one I was alluding to earlier, uh, where um, differences in qual like how big of a gap in qualifications is involved with strong affirmative action is going to be highly relevant. And that's efficiency. Um, by definition, strong uh, affirmative action is not hiring the most efficient people, because you're hiring the people who are less qualified. And again, earlier I said, in many cases, there are jobs where 
the extra qualifications don't mean an increase in efficiency. But there are plenty of jobs in which that is the case, so this is something that could very easily be a moral concern. And the greater the disparity between the applicant you passed over and the less qualified applicant you gave the job to, the more that there's a risk here of a loss of efficiency. And there's going to be a cost there. And Hedinger doesn't try to shy away from that or ignore it or dismiss it or something like that. But he does think that whatever this cost is, this doesn't give grounds for saying that affirmative action is unjust. He uses this example of, of uh, someone who is uh, carrying their groceries to the car one bag at a time instead of two. It's like, you got two hands, you could carry two bags. You're taking more trips if you're carrying them one at a time, especially if your other hand is just dangling and you could be using it and you're just not. But that inefficiency would be like, it's kind of dumb, but it's not unjust. So if we're just appealing to the idea of the inefficiency itself, this doesn't seem to be sufficient grounds for saying that there's an injustice that's happening. Okay, But um, there are some other ways in which the concern about the loss in efficiency might have moral significance. Hedinger brings up the violation of fiduciary responsibility and this unjust treatment of others. And both of them have a similar pattern here, at least in terms of how Hedinger wants to reply to them. But they're both speaking about other moral duties that the manager who's making the hiring decision probably needs to be respecting as a part of making that decision that don't have anything to do here with the applicant. And that's actually Hedinger's reply to these. In the case of both of them, he's like, yeah, okay, this appeal to these other duties or responsibilities of the manager, they might exist, but they also wouldn't explain anything about why the person who is passed over for employment is is the victim of an injustice. They aren't. It's not an injustice that's done against them. Uh, the loss of efficiency would be for somebody else, some other in, uh, some other stakeholder. Like in the case of fiduciary responsibility, the people who are going to bear the burden are the stockholders that are not going to see as high of a return on their investment. So uh, it's a cut to profits, right? Um, I really like in the, the unjust treatment of others, I really like the hospital example. I think this really um, gets at the intuition behind the objection uh, very, very pointedly. And this is the idea, if, if I was making hiring decisions for a hospital, I'm thinking, look, we, with everything else we do at this hospital, we consider ourselves as under a duty to um, protect, uh, to give the best possible care we can to our patients, to any patient who comes to this hospital. We have a duty to them. We have a responsibility to them. So if I hire someone who's less qualified to be a doctor, nurse, whatever, um, then I, I'm threatening the quality of care that I can give to the, to the patients, to the future patients of the hospital. And it's be out of concern for them that I'm not going to do that. Right? And again, there might be, depending on the extremity of the loss of efficiency, that will be a, a greater concern. Um, if it's a small one, it might not be that big of a deal. Um, if you're talking about two applicants who are, if you imagine like a baseline of minimal qualifications, and the difference here is maybe a big difference, but it's so high up in terms of like being above what is needed uh, for the minimal qualifications, then that may not be a big deal. If the two people disparity here is like much closer to the line of minimal comp uh, competency or minimal qualifications, then that might be a bigger issue. But again, these things are going to be circumstantially contingent. And I think Hedinger is going to say something like, sure, that's fine, yeah. There's other things going on here that are morally relevant other than just having an equal society. There's other moral values that we even care about when it comes to social justice other than equality of opportunity. Um, so that, that'd that be fine if those moral considerations are kind of held in balance with each other. Um, the violation of fiduciary responsibility thing, that's going to maybe just get back to the, the fiduciary duty debate. And it's going to depend on how that all works out. If Again, if stockholder theory is correct, then all the rest of this becomes irrelevant, right? That gives the idea that an, a company in how it's hiring people can do some good for society in promoting social justice. I mean, that's a social responsibility if I ever heard one. <laughs> so if stockholder theory says you can't do any of those things, that it would be impermissible for the company to be at all concerned with social responsibility, then this is all a moot point anyway. Um, but that's probably unlikely. I mean, I don't think stockholder theory is really able to defend itself, but that's my two cents on it. I mean, we'd, but we'd have to resolve that debate before we'd be able to entertain how it works here. So it's kind of like moving along. But in either event, 
Henger still says, even if there's a concern here, what I'm calling in the lecture notes 1b and 1c, concerns 1b, 1c, um, even if those are real concerns, they definitely don't get at any kind of intuition that the person who's passed over for um, the job, who doesn't get the job um, because it was given to this less qualified applicant, that some injustice has happened to them. It hasn't. But we've got other arguments that are going to attack that more directly, like this next one, that the most qualified person has a right to the job. Now, we, we haven't talked a ton about human rights in particular yet, and I'm, I'm somewhat tempted to do a little bit of that right now. But just in general, if you're going to confer human rights onto a, a person, if you're, so you're going to give someone a right, then you are at the same time logically imposing an obligation onto everybody else. So if I have a right to life, a right to not be killed unjustly, then that means everyone else is under an obligation to not kill me unjustly. Right now, maybe talk about killing in self-defense. If I attack them, you know, then maybe if they kill me, then that's not a violation of my rights or something like that. We could start splitting some hairs on exception cases. But in general, if you want to say you've got a right to something, then everyone else now has an obligation to respect that. So basically to say uh, that the most qualified person has a right to the job means that everyone else has the obligation to give them the job. And Hedinger is like, uh, yeah, no. When and where is this actually the plausible way in which we understand uh, what managers or people who have jobs available, what they are forced or morally compelled to have to do in those situations? He's like, it doesn't work. He gives this example here of, um, I live in a town, I need my fence painted. And just so happens in this town, we've got a professional painter, someone who is definitely qualified for this. They're running their own business just doing this. They've been doing it for 20 years. They got all the best equipment, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I give the job to my nephew, you know, like a summer job thing. Yeah, you know, you can you can paint paint my fence. For that professional painter to be like, injustice has been done against me, it seems totally implausible. Like. It's my money, it's my fence, I can hire whoever I want for it. Right? That's my prerogative to do that. It's not like just because this person has more qualifications, I'm somehow morally compelled to give them the job. That seems absurd. Now, a student brought up in my other class that they were like, yeah, you know, this might just be a cherry-picked example that when it comes to uh, temporary contract jobs, yeah, that probably seems okay, but when it comes to more permanent positions, they felt like there's a stronger intuition to say that the person has a right to the job. I didn't get the chance to follow up with them. I'm curious if anyone in, in chat has that similar intuition and what might be going on there. Um, personally, I, I'm kind of with Hedinger on this. I don't see the plausible basis for saying we have a moral obligation to give qualified people jobs. Um, I can understand uh, how we have a moral grounds for, say, rights to life, you know, that kind of thing, out of respect for basic dignity, in extension of the categorical imperatives, stuff like that. You can do that. Um, I don't see how those same kinds of arguments could justify uh, a right to a particular job. Um, Hedinger says, though, and I, I kind of agree with him about this too, that he could be cool with there being a right to employment but not a right to a particular job or not on the basis of having the most qualifications. He doesn't see that happening. Like, I think employment is actually one of the things that the UN Declaration of Human Rights has on its list. It's got dozens of rights. I mean, it's, it's not a very small list of human rights. And employment's one of those. I think the argument for why you'd have a right to employment is basically on the grounds of how you have a right to livelihood. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness kind of thing. Like, having a job is kind of connected with having a life. It, because uh, in our society, livelihood, putting food on the table, having a shelter over your head, is dependent on money that you need, that the way you get it is by having a job, then it's pretty important for people to have jobs. If they don't have jobs, they can't live. Um, so that would be the basis of the moral authority for saying you have a right to employment. Um, but not for a particular job and not on the grounds of you being more qualified. That's just part of the basic dignity of being a human being. Um, also, we can imagine how, this is just a side tangent, but it might be interesting to some of you. Um, if you've ever heard of post-scarcity economics, like when robots take all of our jobs away from us, that that might not be a terrible outcome, because uh, it, if we, it'll just mean that we don't have to do all this work anymore. The robots can do it for us. We have more time for leisure. But we are going to have to redesign our economy so that people's livelihood is not dependent on having a job. 
in which case the right to employment might be closer to like a right to entertainment which is actually listed on the UN Declaration of Human Rights as well that people have a right to you know engage in hobbies and do things for fun to play basically um, and employment could be in that would be in that category then instead of like a right to the means to have a stable livelihood um, but that's about all that I can imagine saying on behalf of this idea of the most qualified person having a right to the job, how rights would get into this conversation. Um, okay. Again, chat, feel free to jump in if you got any questions. Um, oh, I'm seeing something coming through here. In the painter example, could it be that the professional painter got there from getting his start painting fences? Uh, possibly. I'm, I'm actually thinking of a, of a possible analogous scenario here uh, that has to do with basketball or professional sports in general. So this could be flipped to the corporation world where opportunity has to be there for that same reason. I'm not sure I'm understanding that question. Opportunity has to be there for the same reason. What would that reason be? For people to be able to develop their skills and abilities and qualifications? I mean, definitely to, to kind of take, I, I mentioned that um, for somebody to be qualified, yes, okay, cool. So I mentioned that affirmative action has its correlates in uh, admission, um, uh, college admissions, university admissions. And part of the idea here is that, well, yeah, you can't have um, equality of opportunity in this like fair fight of the competition for jobs if some people, because of their privileged status, are able to get better educations than other people, which they can get their kind of leg up on everyone else, but not because they deserve it or anything, but just because of their position of power in society um, for, for these kind of arbitrary reasons. So uh, there's a concern about trying to level a playing field that way. Um, it, or it could be about internships, right? Like any of these things are uh, going to be a part of the same debate. And I, I don't know if I mentioned this already. I'm having deja vu, but it might just come from my lecture in the, from this earlier this afternoon. Um, but I'm very familiar with in this debate that like when we're talking about affirmative action in the business world, people are like, it shouldn't be happening in the business world. It should be happening earlier in the education thing. Like when people are set up to be able to be in a position to compete for jobs, there's where you need the fairness. Not, not at the business level. We need to do it there. But then when the debate happens in the, in the, uh, about the education setting like universities and colleges and this sort of thing a lot of times I've heard the arguments that people are like yeah it shouldn't be happening here at the level of the the education stuff because that should be on the merit of the the college the uh, student applicants but it's a matter of the home life right it's the home life growing up and when people have these bad living conditions then they're then it's harder for them to be a student and stuff like that so we should fix that problem guess where that's punting the problem too back to getting the jobs right so it's back to the business world so people are just kind of passing the burden back and forth about like who should be picking this up um and that's you know kind of absurd to me i hope it's absurd to you too uh if if it's if it's going to be justified in principle to do anywhere it's probably something we're going to be wanting to do everywhere at like all these different levels um in which qualifications are relevant for how people end up getting treated um, that this is a, a systemic issue. It's not just like one choke point in the process. It's a cyclical thing. Um, so that's very hard. But another thing I thought that you were kind of maybe getting at here, Walter, is that I was imagining other kinds of possible counterexamples in which, uh, you know, giving fail a failure to give the most qualified person the job is not violating anybody's rights here or is not an unjust thing. And I was thinking about professional sports when like a team sucks and they know they suck and they're trying to get into being a better team, they oftentimes will give minutes to younger players, like rookie players who are not the most qualified people to be putting on the court. Like they're in, in say basketball, how many minutes are played by different players is like a big deal. Bench players play less minutes than the stars usually especially if the team is trying to compete to win. 
They want to put the best players on the court for as long as possible to be able to compete to win the games. Um, but when the team really sucks and they're working for like the long-term investment, they might sit a bench uh, and bench a real star player. And that star player might be grumpy about that, right? They might be like, but I'm a better player than these people. But we don't think that there's some kind of injustice that's been done against them. And oftentimes, when players complain about that, we're like, that's just a prima donna. Like, they're unjustified to be complaining about that kind of stuff, right? They don't see the bigger picture here. And that's kind of what Hedinger would say here, too. That, like, there's a purpose to this. This isn't something arbitrary. Um, but the failure to hire the most qualified person is for the sake of this long-term goal of social justice. Um, and it's not like in itself there's a violation of rights here by not hiring them. Okay, um, the next one is a very interesting one. Uh, next variation on this argument style. That the most qualified person deserves the job. Okay, now this isn't the same as like having a right to it. But it's sort of like deserving in the sense of worthy of praise or worthy of blame kind of thing. Think back to Aristotle, right? Um, if someone is uh, excellent and praiseworthy, is eudaimon, an example of human life at its very best, um, then that's a kind of praise that they deserve. Remember Aristotle, I mentioned really briefly, Aristotle thinks the life of honor is somewhat superficial because that's just about whether you're popular, whether people praise you. It's more about the people doing the praising than it is the person who's being praised. And the person who legitimately wants honor in a way that's not superficial is not just wanting the praise, they want to be deserving of the praise. And that's a matter of what they're up to. Not about their favorable circumstances, not about the other things that are going on in the world, but a matter of what they're up to. And and Aristotle's analysis of dessert is very close to Hedinger's, okay? Maybe you remember that when it came to picking out which goods were the most important goods for the excellent life, and thus an excellent person, Aristotle had that criteria of stability. They said those goods that depend less on the world, that are less contingent in order to achieve, um, are the ones that actually are more deserving of giving this, being given this privileged status of defining excellence. Because if achieving that good is less dependent on what the world's contribution is, and it's more about your contribution, then it's more a credit to you. Those goods that rely on favorable circumstances more from the world in order to be achieved is really more about like the luck of the world. It's, it's on the world. We're kind of celebrating the favorable conditions, not celebrating the virtue of the person. Okay, So that's the same thing that Henger's saying here. When we're looking at our qualifications, we have to ask ourselves, where are they coming from? Why do we have the qualifications that we do? And the qualifications we have are influenced by things like innate ability, home environment, socioeconomic class appearance, quality of the schools attended, some luck, like who you know, stuff like that, and then effort and perseverance. And on that laundry list of variables that causally affect what qualifications we end up having, only the last one, Hedinger says, is one that would get us the notion of being deserving. Here, I'm going to pause for a second here while the cars happen. So this, um, this argument from this objection about how the most qualified person deserves the job is really using the logic of meritocracy. Um, that people who are have more merit are deserving of more reward. And people that do less are less deserving, or whatever the metric is for evaluation here. Um, and what Hedinger is trying to do is like, okay, well, let's look at like what is really the basis of merit. It's what you do, what you put into something. This is also connected with like uh, the stuff I was talking about earlier from American culture about individualism, the mythology of pulling yourself up from your bootstraps and this sort of thing. That if you work hard enough, you'll be able to be successful and then your success will be something you've basically earned. That you deserve the success because of how much you've worked at it. But it doesn't always work out that way. And the way in which you end up being successful through your qualifications may not have everything to do with what you've put into it. But there are all these other external forces, circumstantial forces, which you didn't have any control over and you can't take any credit for. And Hedinger kind of flips this meritocratic argument on its head. If he says, okay, fair, you want to play the merit card? Let's play the merit card. Usually, it's the people from the disenfranchised demographics that have to put way more effort and commitment into getting the qualifications that they do have, even when that's less qualifications than the people that they're competing against for jobs. So if we were going to award the job to the person solely on the basis of merit, it's not always, but 
very often the time that it would be given to the less qualified applicant, the objectively less qualified applicant. Uh, that's that's, and it's. Uh, I want to emphasize here because Hedinger emphasizes it that as far as he's concerned, he's not trying to use a meritocratic argument to justify affirmative action. He's only mentioning this logic because the opponent is bringing it up as an objection. They're playing the merit card, so he's like, "You really want to play the merit card? You play the merit card. It's going to turn. Out, it's going to backfire on you. Basically, this is going to be more justification for affirmative action rather than undermining it." Um, so that's a kind of interesting judo move that he pulls there. And then finally, we've got this argument that says the most qualified person is entitled to the job. Now, we've been looking at, like, taking the same phrase and, like, just swapping out these different words. But there are some very important theoretical distinctions between all of these. They're, they're appealing to very different types of moral values and concepts. Um, I hope, chat, that these distinctions and, my, and how I've been lecturing on them is uh, sharp and clear for you. If they're not, please let me know. But this last one is, is a very different wrinkle, even though... Entitlement sounds like a word that's really close to have a right or deserve or something like that. Um, this is a very different thing. The idea behind entitlement is basically affirmative action rewrites the rules of the game. That the way that society is set up, um, the rules of how it functions, gives the citizens that are in that society the basis of an expectation that if they work hard and become the most qualified employee, then they will get the job. That that's the rules of how it works. And so people put in all this effort to try to increase their qualifications to be competitive. And then if it turns out that they apply for the job and they get turned down, even though they are the most qualified, just because of an affirmative action policy, then it's like society just pulled the rug out from under them, blindsided them with this social justice crap when they were like, I didn't think the world worked like this, right? So it's the way in which reverse discrimination frustrates or affirmative action frustrates this expectation that is some kind of unjust wrong that's being done against the applicant who is more qualified that's getting passed over. And that's that's the kind of core argument here about the entitlement thing or the, the moral appeal about the entitlement argument. There's also, uh, Hedinger mentions this argument that just says, well, and it's illegal, right? That a failure to hire, hire the most qualified person is violating Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which is the law on the books that basically makes traditional discrimination illegal. Um, as Hedinger points out, the legal status of Title VII is somewhat complicated. There have been plenty of Supreme Court rulings that have said affirmative action is not a violation of Title VII. Um, I would say, uh, you know, this was written a few years back, uh, and the story around affirmative action continues. Like I said, there just was a court case, like, last month about, uh, I think, a university in Texas. Um, and this is an ongoing debate. It's one of the kind of topics of current affairs. And the Supreme Court has given kind of not directly contradictory rulings, but things that kind of tip the scales one way or the other. And there still is this kind of legal ambiguity. But again, the legal thing just doesn't matter. We're talking about ethics here. The law does not have the authority to dictate uh, what's going on here. But the way in which it might be brought into this argument is about how well, the presence of it being a law on the books is the basis for why people in society could expect that this is what's going to happen. And then when affirmative action swoops in and does its thing, that this is pulling the rug out from under people. Okay, Hedinger's reply to this kind of moral concern is basically that, again, this doesn't have a leg to stand on. This isn't holding any water. Why? Um, because Again, the legal status is not clearly in favor of what this expectation is, the vision of this expectation. Secondly, it's not like affirmative action is something new that's blindsiding people. It's been around for decades and decades and decades, and it's been in a part of society. It's been happening. So it's not something new that people should be surprised at. They'd have to be living under a rock to not know about affirmative action. Edinger would, uh, he doesn't put it quite like that, but that's the point he's making. And he also says, regardless of what you think about affirmative action, and your awareness of how it's integrated into how our society functions, this just isn't how society functions anyway. Like, if you have this expectation that if you're the most qualified applicant, you're going to get the job, that's just naive. Plenty of times, people that are less qualified get jobs over people who are more qualified. You can't just submit your, your resume, your really amazing, impressive resume to a company, and expect you're going to be the person who's going to be hired, even if you're correct in judging that you're the most qualified person. People, uh, especially nowadays in the business world, since I started teaching this business ethics class and talked with a lot of 
business majors and, and people that are much deeper in the business world than I am, I've seen a, the trend of networking just shoot up. Like that the way to get a job is really to network. It's not so much about building up your resume as much as who you know. And people hire people based on those connections um, and connections of trust, not what they see on the resume, right? So um, I think Hedinger has a point with that too, that's saying like the, the whole grounds for saying the most qualified person is entitled to the job is on the basis of this kind of social expectation that that's how things are supposed to work. But that is a ridiculous expectation to have. There's nothing that really supports it or grounds it or justifies holding that expectation. So that undermines the argument. Okay, there's one last spurious objection here. I, I'm kind of talking a little faster because we've got some more arguments to get through, and I don't want to keep you up all night here. Um, but chat, uh, how are we doing so far? Uh, that midsection here about failure to hire the most qualified person being unjust, that's all feeling good. All those arguments are clearly separated from each other in how I lectured on it. How are you, you feeling? It always comes back to who you know when it comes to high-level business decisions. Yeah, I mean, based on all my observations about how the business world works, this seems to be maybe not the exclusive factor. Like, some pretty amazing credentials are probably pretty helpful, um, but that's definitely not the only thing that's going on here. And like, uh, there's an argument that Hedinger is going to use a lot toward the end of this paper here. Um, that he's like, well, if we're cool with this over here, wouldn't it, we be even more cool with it happening for the sake of a purpose like social justice? He's going to play that card quite a lot. I think that definitely works here. If we think there's no injustice happening when people are just hiring people based on who they know, then how much more is it, it totally permissible for a manager to make a hiring decision on the basis of trying to promote social equality? Yeah, even professional sports drafting. Yes, yeah, that's right, yeah. 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 So there's tons of counterexamples there to that that claim from the opponent. Okay, so the last spurious objection we've got here uh, is that affirmative action undermines equal opportunity for white males. And Hedinger's uh, kind of a little quick with this one, I think. Um, and but maybe he doesn't need to do anything more. Um, he says, well, if you're really talking about equal opportunity, you're talking that that requires that we're all starting at the same starting line here. People don't have handicaps about this, but that's not what's going on. Um, we're, and the, the goal of equal opportunity is the goal of affirmative action. We're trying to get there, but we got to do something to get there. And he, he's saying it's not that um, white males have equal opportunity when they get onto the job market. They have a greater than equal opportunity. There's a contrast here with what they're working with. Um, and again, in individual cases, it may not fit the general trend, but there there are some patterns like this of what's going on. And if we can do something to deal with those forces that create those inequalities, if we can remove those barriers from equal opportunity out of the equation, then we should be doing that sort of thing. Again, there's a distinction here about how are you trying to justify affirmative action. And Henger reminds us about this when he's responding to this argument. He's like, I'm not arguing for this on the basis of redistributing opportunity or advantages in order to make up for a history of inequality. This isn't like stuff was stolen from your people in the past, so now we're going to give it to you, get extra advantages now. It's not disturbing equal opportunity um, in order to make up for some previous stuff in the past that happened, the injustice from the past. Instead, it's about setting up a future of equality that we need to get toward given our current state of inequality. And that's the that kind of forward-looking justification for affirmative action. That's what Hedinger is leaning on for his arguments uh, in favor of it. Okay, the last section of the paper is about these legitimate objections. And there's two of them, and they're a little bit more complicated, so they're going to take a little bit more time here. I'll try to move through these quickly, try to summarize the basic gist of it, again, so I don't keep you up all night. Um, in fact, uh, before I forget, let's do a code word um, 
now that I, I just it just crossed my mind. So let's do here we go. Code word? Milk crate. Milk crate's a code word tonight. That's what I got nearby. So that's what it's going to be. I'm resting my foot on it. Um, milk crate is the code word for tonight. Milk crate. Okay. Um, I'll try to get you the gist of these two arguments um, because they are a little bit more more complicated. If you want to talk to me more about them, be happy to. Um, and chat, let me know if, if there's some other like things that my treatment in the next few minutes doesn't doesn't address. Uh, again, these what uh, Hedinger is calling the legitimate objections are those moral concerns about affirmative action that he thinks do hold water. He's like, there's something to this. Not enough for it to be a fatal blow to the appropriateness of affirmative action on balance, all things considered, but still something that he's like, you got a point here. That this is a this is a downside about affirmative action. Um, but he's the so basically the response here is not going to be this is nothing, which is what his response was for all the spurious objections, but rather that this is a wound, but it's only a flesh wound. It's not a fatal blow. It's not, um, yeah, it's not something that is going to undermine all the legitimacy of affirmative action. It's just a complication. And if there's anything we can do to offset this concern, we should do it. But all things considered, we might take the hit. We might have these moral costs for the sake of these other moral goods. And and giving those, he's not just dismissing them that way. He's gonna, he has to give argument to shoulder his burden of proof that we should think of these moral concerns as not weighty enough to disturb us. And that's where he's gonna do this argument from analogy that I've been alluding to. That he's gonna show other circumstances in which we're happy tolerating the same kind of moral concern for the sake of some other end, and say, well, that more that end in those cases that we are intuitively comfortable with is not even as noble or as important or as meaningful as the value of social justice and equality. So if we're cool with that, we should be cool with affirmative action too. This is actually an argument form called, uh, again, more Latin stuff here. These like technical Latin phrases philosophers used, love to use. Um, this is an off fortiori argument. And what that means is it's sort of like, if it goes for this, so much more should it go for this. Right? If you're able to establish an argument that justifies a controversial conclusion, then an even less controversial conclusion should be similarly justified. Okay? Um, that's, that's the way uh, this argument form works. It's a, it's a common argument form, and uh, Hedinger is applying it in this case too. But what's this first concern? The first concern is really a concern about respecting people's autonomy. So think back of the world of Kant here. Um, the problem is that affirmative action judges on the basis of involuntary characteristics. Now that phrase on its own probably doesn't do anything for you. Uh, but let me try to flesh it out a little bit. The real concern here is that, oh, uh, let me set it up this way actually. I think this is helpful. Do you remember when I did the Kant lecture? I said the categorical imperative creates a absolute obligation and duty. It's a moral law. It's exceptionless. It's supposed to be applied to all circumstances, no matter what. Like, you have to respect people as intrinsically valuable, to treat them as an end, and not treat them solely as a means. That's, it's never okay to use a person like a tool or to treat them as just a device for some other end, even a beneficent one. So the categorical imperative itself is an absolute rule, exceptionless, according to Kant. And it's all about respecting people's autonomy. The dignity, the Kantian dignity is all about you're the kind of thing that can exist as an end unto itself, right? In other words, you have intrinsic value. And I said that while there's that hard limit that's going to rule out certain actions as being immoral, like rape or slavery or stuff like that, blatant cases of people being used as tools or mechanisms or means for some other purpose and not respected as ends in themselves, it's also going to exert some pressure on things that are not necessary but are more contingent moral goods, things that might be better or worse, um, that aren't themselves absolute goods. And what Hedinger is talking about with this opponent's argument is in that kind of category, that out of respect for um, the, the moral value on autonomy, we should also value giving people as much opportunity to express their autonomy as possible. 
so that it's it's more morally ideal for me to treat you uh, in a pattern or with respect to rules or procedures or policies that give you more space to make decisions for yourself. So let me use some illustrations for this. If um, if you're if I've got a job and you apply to the job, and I say to you, nope, I don't like you. I'm never gonna like you. Uh, you're not gonna get the job. Um, or if I say you 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 can't get this job because like I'm racist or something, I'm like because you're black, can't get the job. That's really frustrating because you can't do anything about that. Right? There's nothing you can do. You don't get to make any choices about it. There's no path of like how could you maybe get the job or something like that. Contrast that with a different situation where um, you apply to the job and I reject you. I say nope, sorry, I can't give you this position because you're not qualified for it. If you had this certification, if you had this experience or something like that, then I could hire you for this job. That way of treating you, it still doesn't get you what you want, which again is not what autonomy is about anyway, but it gives you the opportunity to make a choice. You're like, well, how much do I care about getting this job? Do I want to do the things that would then put me in a position to be able to get this job? Is it worth it for me to put that investment in? Now, the way that I'm treating you gives you more opportunity for you to have autonomous decisions. Rather than if I'm like, nope, nothing you can do about it, nope, job. Or I, I cite a reason, like an involuntary characteristic, that you can't change. Um, it's kind of when we get at this um, intuition that it's like, it's not fair to be judged for characteristics that you have no control over. So when we look at traditional discrimination, we're like, yeah, if you say this person can't get this job because they're black, that seems unfair because they can't do anything about that. They didn't decide what race they're going to be born as. But it's also why the opponent comes back and says, well, this isn't fair to the white males. They didn't decide to be born as white males. You're judging them based on characteristics that they don't have any control over. That's unfair in the same sort of way. But Henninger says, look, first off, to say that one of these things is morally ideal doesn't mean that it's morally mandatory. That it's not, uh, that's not a case of a violation of a moral obligation and thus an injustice. This is just something that's more um, desirable as like, that's why I was saying like, it's not the categorical imperative itself that justifies this, but it just sort of exerts this pressure about like, what would be a more ideal situation? If we already value autonomy, we think that's important to respect, then something that gives more space for autonomy would be better than less space. But like a, re a respect for people's freedom doesn't require letting them do whatever they want or having the power of a god or a dictator or something like that. I mean, that's not what freedom is about for Kant. It's really about this ability to be in control of your own will. That That's the main thing. Um, and that's why appealing to people for reasons rather than using coercive force is justified, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the main response that Henger gives to this argument is that we do this kind of discrimination constantly. We judge people based on involuntary characteristics, like in every, almost every sector of the economy. Um, a lot of this comes down to genetic sort of stuff. Um, like uh, I was using the example this afternoon of like, if I'm three foot six, I'm not going to play in the NBA. Like there's, it doesn't matter how much effort I want to put into it. Like I'm not going to have the qualifications. And sure, there is some voluntary activity that's involved with people competing for jobs in the NBA, but there's some people who are never going to be able to have that dream realized, um, that they're not going to be able to have that opportunity because of characteristics that they don't really have control over. They didn't decide what body they're going to be born in, right? But we don't think that's sort of unfair, for one thing. But also that we don't think, even if we think that there's some kind of problem with it, um, it's not so fatal of a problem that we think that there's an injustice that's occurred. And what Hedinger really puts his finger on here is that in most of these cases where we do judge people for involuntary characteristics, it's justified on the grounds of efficiency. It's like, well, you're just if we give you the opportunity to do this job, then it's not going to be done as well. And so we're asking to basically take the hit, right? That like, uh, well, I'm kind of sneaking into the next argument, but um, it's saying that, like, for the sake of efficiency, we need to hire different people that are more qualified based on the cause of qualifications that isn't a credit to the person themselves. Okay? So, Hedinger's argument is, if we're cool with judging people 
based on involuntary characteristics, even though that's not ideal. But if we're cool with that for the sake of promoting efficiency or profit, then how much more should we be cool paying that cost for the sake of social justice, for the sake of equality? Um, it's like this is a moral cost, but we're willing to pay it over here for these things. We should definitely be willing to pay it over here for these things. So that also shows that this isn't a silver bullet. I mean, if it was, then that would completely defeat most of how our economy works, how the business world works around hiring decisions, right? If we if we couldn't judge people on anything related to involuntary characteristics, then the whole idea of a meritocratic thing or like whoever is most qualified should get the job would just completely blow up. And the person who would be advocating affirmative action, like Hedinger here, would say like, yeah, you're not doing that, right? So you can't have a double standard here where you're saying, these are the rules for judging affirmative action, but here's, here are the rules for the profit-maximizing world of business. It's like, fair is fair here, right? If you want to use that argument there, you better let me use it here too. Okay, So there's that um, off fortiori argument happening. Chat, how are we doing? Is that okay? Like this was a, this, Both of these last two arguments are pretty complicated, so I want to make sure my, my explanations are, are getting the point across. Um, and please feel free to give me some feedback here about that. Uh, just a yes if it's working, and no if it's not, um, let me know. I know what you're going to say, Theo. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Theo, I just can't trust you anymore. Like, you're not, you can't be my canary in the coal mine. So I need to hear from some other people. <laughs> I say that half in jest. Okay, cool. If it's not coming together for someone, please don't be shy. Like it's never it's never a bad thing to admit if something's not working for you because it's probably my fault and I want to know about that and do do a better job here so let me know um, all right but let's get through uh, this last argument here um, this last argument complains that affirmative action burdens white males without compensation so it's sort of like um, as we already admitted there's gonna be some costs there's gonna be some burdens to an affirmative action hiring policy um, some people are gonna get the jobs and some people are not gonna get the jobs and there are going to be uh, losses of opportunity for white males as a part of this. Like, that's just a practical reality of it. I mean, that's that's what's going to happen, okay? And they don't get compensated for it. It's not like if companies are doing affirmative action policies, or this is what so, how society is sort of operating, that white males get anything out of it. And that might be unfair, that might be unjust. And Hedinger is... Um, sort of he's really sensitive to this I think because I think it's part of what motivates him to refuse to justify affirmative action in some of the ways that people might try to justify it like somehow white males deserve to be punished so they should be given these burdens because in the past their people did all this bad shit Hedinger's like no that's not the argument I want to use also it's not like they need to compensate somehow for unfair advantages um, it's, it's, this isn't sort of like we need to knock them down a peg or something. This is really about giving opportunity to other people, like letting them in in the party, letting them have a chance, um, instead of the kind of systemic uh, lack of opportunity that people in those demographics generally experience in society today. Okay, that's, it's about creating a world of equal opportunity. That's the purpose. Is not a matter of um, trying to to uh, e even the scales or something like that. Um, this isn't about getting even. It's about creating an even playing field. That's what it's really about for Hedinger. So he thinks this is a kind of social good, right? That uh, it is a worthy end um, of a just society to have equality of opportunity. It's the kind of values that I was saying earlier America is founded on. Um, it's one thing that we think is one of the most American things, 
about us, right? Or I, on paper, right? Theoretically, it doesn't always happen. We, I mean, by evidence that we don't live in an equal society, we're not fulfilling that promise perfectly. But that promise is a legitimate one. It's a worthy goal to aspire to. Hedinger is saying here. And be, and for these social goods, we think it is appropriate to impose some burdens in order to achieve them. Um, I, he doesn't make this connection directly, but taxes are a burden, right? They're a burden that the government imposes on people. Society imposes burden on people through taxes to be able to promote things that are in the public good, like free access to education, like schools, public schools, libraries, um, fire departments, police departments, road maintenance. All of these kinds of things are in the public interest. And also things like public defenders, um, to make sure that justice is served in cases of criminal um, indictments. When someone is accused by the government of doing wrong and then is punishable under the law, we think there's values of justice that need to protect people's rights, and so you got to pay some public defenders to do that, right? So the government does that. All of these things are cases of a burden being imposed on citizens in society, private citizens, through taxes, in order to make a public good happen. And by analogy, that's the same thing in principle that's happening here. It's just the business is doing this. Um, again, we could have the fiduciary duty debate about this, like all the Friedman arguments. But in principle, we're cool with the idea of, for a worthy social goal, that there are going to be some consequences, that some people are going to, to bear some burdens. Okay. Now, how could this be justified? Again, Hedinger's main argument of justification is argument from analogy. So he's like, well, look at all these other cases in which we're cool with this, like I was just doing with the tax sort of situation. But he says it's not just a matter of the government. I mean, his examples don't use the government. I'm, I'm the one who brought that stuff up. Um, but he's thinking, look at the other burdens that businesses impose on other citizens in society based on their circumstances uh, in a way that they're not compensated for. That people who are less qualified don't get opportunities. Why? Because they're less efficient. And we need that efficiency. That is a social good. <laughs> I mean, it's also an individual good for some people, like profit maximizing. But that's a burden that we're asking other people to bear. And you kind of think about it in a vacuum. If you can, if you can get a little distance from these intuitions from our society and culture about meritocracy and it's just like this dogma that people who are more qualified deserve more if you can get a little bit of distance from that intuition you can see in a vacuum that there's a lot of things that people might like to do with their life that they're not given the opportunity to do because there's someone else who can do it better and that is a kind of burden and we might think it's a justified burden and Hedinger doesn't actually dispute some of the grounds here for the justification of that he's like it makes sense we're asking it for the sake of efficiency. It's like, if we gave this opportunity to this other person, then there are other people, other stakeholders, that wouldn't get as good of a product, or not as good of a service, or there wouldn't be as much profit, the company would not be as viable, that other people wouldn't be able to get, we wouldn't be able to offer as many jobs, blah, 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 blah. Like all the ways in which economic institutions, businesses, firms, are integrated with everything else in the fabric of society. If we have those inefficiencies, that hurts the society in myriad ways. So to ask people who have less qualifications, especially in those cases that where it's not their fault, right? It's not under something that they have voluntary control over. Then Hendra's like, if we're cool with that for the sake of efficiency, for the sake of increasing people's well-being in society, the consequences of greater efficiency, then shouldn't we be cool with it for the sake of justice? Right? That should matter there too. Same exact argument we saw before. Okay. Um, so again, uh, these these costs are appropriate. Now he also talks about the compensation issue here. Um, I, I oh I skipped over Nagel's argument here. Okay, you you've read the article. Um, this isn't complicated. Uh, we we have these other examples of um, people being asked to bear a social burden with this law of eminent domain where a company or the government wants to build a highway they just be like we're buying your property we're gonna give you some money for it but you don't really have a choice about it um, and sometimes people sue and you know goes to the courts and blah 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 but um, this is a law that's on the books and the government uses it from time to time they're like for the sake of this public good like 
If we need to alleviate the terrible traffic situation in Seattle. We're going to build this highway. And too bad, too sad, there's some houses in the way. We're going to buy that property to build the highway. Um, but there's compensation there. Because it would be like, if the U.S. government just like took people's property and didn't compensate them, they like kicked them out of their home, be like, sorry, we're building this highway. Go live somewhere. I don't know. Then that would be totally unjust, right? Now, there is still a burden because... The compensation that people receive for their homes or their properties is not maybe as much as they could have got if they were selling it on the market um, and people are competing for buying it and stuff like that. So there is a cost there. But it's not like they're left totally destitute because of this eminent domain law. So what about for the case of white males that are turned over for employment because of an affirmative action policy? Um, well, he says, Edinger says, he'd be more compelled about the call for compensation if this was a huge burden, a substantial burden. He's like, usually it's not. If you're a very highly qualified white male in a world in which there already is social privilege around that, then if you don't get this job, you're gonna get some other job. And honestly, uh, in a lot of cases, in order to get a job, you have to apply to a lot of places and you get more no's than you get yeses. So it's not that weird to lose a job here or there because of an affirmative action hiring policy and there's some other place that is gonna hire you. And no one, it's not like affirmative action policies are going to result in a workforce that's entirely minorities. <laughs> I mean, that would be counterproductive for what its goals are, too. So um, there's going to be some opportunities here somewhere for the white males that are getting passed over for employment. Okay, that's about it for uh, the arguments here in the paper. Um, if anyone's got some leftover questions about it, I'm happy to answer questions for a few more minutes here. Uh, we're already over two hours, so that's a lot, a plenty of lecturing for tonight, I think. Um, but let me know how you do in chat, um, and maybe there's some leftover questions here for me to answer. Good night. You're welcome. I mean, this is a big, messy debate. I mean, if people wanted to process this and have conversation about it, I would not be surprised. My afternoon class did. So I really would, I'm totally fine talking with you more here tonight. Um, do we do the reading comments on what we are presenting for this week or the other reading? Um, oh, if you're talking about the presentation assignment, um, whatever reading that you're presenting on, you don't have to do reading comments for. And you don't have to do a journal on the week that you're doing the presentation. I didn't want you to have to double dip on that. Um, but for anything else, like if you're, let's say you were signed up for Hedinger, yeah, you got to do reading comments for Pojman. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. You're welcome, Walter. It sounded like there was some stuff you were kind of chewing on throughout this lecture. So if you've got some leftover stuff, that, like some hanging threads, I'd, I'd love to get them in here. And anyone needs to leave, feel free to leave. I, I mean, your class is dismissed <laughs> if you've got to go. Um, but if you want to hang around and chat a little bit, I'll, I'll throw it on the video here, and, and maybe it's, it'll be useful to some other people too. All right, we're all done here on this one. Um, we'll get the other side of the argument here with uh, Pojman as a representative on Tuesday when I see you in person. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube later, or even if you're in the chat tonight, um, if you uh, have some comments, questions, things to discuss, I hope we can have some class discussion on Tuesday. Come, come prepared to class to, to share stuff like that. I'm not going to force you or anything, but I'd ask you to uh, consider how you're processing, processing all these issues in this controversy and to share your thoughts with your classmates um, and with me. And uh, definitely get in contact with me about the paper sooner rather than later. Let's, let's clear topics. Don't overlook that step. Don't put it off. Uh, get those juices flowing early. Get, you want to get some direction early and let your subconscious mind do your work for you because it can. With philosophy, it absolutely can. 
once you've like put the stuff on the table, you've pulled out the cards in your mind and thought about them, and you've got the vision put together, you'll be surprised that if you just kind of let it percolate in the background and reflect on it, that when it comes down to sit down and type the thing, you're going to have a lot more going on than if you're just putting the vision together right in front of writing the paper all in the same night or something like that. Worst case scenario. So be in touch with me. I'm here to support you. Let me be involved. Um, I, it's very invited, but I'm also respectful of your space. So I'm asking that you kind of advocate. You reach out to me. Let me know. I'm not going to be breathing down your neck about this. Um, but if you want me to be closely involved with your efforts and have conversations with you as you're processing and brainstorming and editing, I would love to be a part of it as much as you'll let me, like I said before. So that'll be it for that. And I'll see you on Tuesday. Have a great three-day weekend. I hope you're able to enjoy it. Bye.